Okay, welcome everybody. Thanks for tuning in and joining us for our first talk, which is going to be about data analysis and ingestions in AWS for Ethereum. And it will be presented to you by Anton, who is a data engineer. So take it away, Anton. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone, and thank you for joining me at PyChain Conference. I am Anton, your expert data engineer today. Uh, in my talk, Ethereum Data Analysis and Integration in AWS, I'm going to present you my most recent solution in the blockchain area. This is a data platform for analyzing Ethereum data and using it in real-time applications. Actually, this talk is a brief summary of my original Medium article about exporting a full history of Ethereum into S3. Uh, the article covers all the details, uh, while my talk is focused on some highlights and main takeaways. To efficiently grasp the knowledge, I recommend you the following. Firstly, listen to my talk and get a general idea. Then go through the article and dive deeper into the details. Finally, reach out to me if you have any questions. I will be happy to discuss it with you and uh, we can do it through Discord or face-to-face. -face. And so I wish you to enjoy my talk uh, and let's get started. Um, I have originally developed this data platform for Coinstats, which is a crypto portfolio manager. The business goal was to calculate the token balances for every wallet. Uh, the API should return a balance for every token ever landed to a wallet and support the most popular token standards like ERC20, 721, and 1155. And also, we have been interested in a list of tokens transfers for each wallet. Uh, here is an example of expected API request for a wallet identified by Enervis, which is in green, it returns a list of all the tokens identified by their contracts addresses with their current balances. An example response includes a list of entries with contract address, token ID, and balance. To calculate these balances, we have to scan through a full history of tokens transfers and simply sum their values. Uh, there are billions of billions of transfers nowadays, so this is a regular big data challenge. Uh, let's map the generic data pipeline to the CoinStats use case I have mentioned above. A generic pipeline includes the three major steps, which are ingestion, querying, and serving. For our use case, an input data is Ethereum blocks, transactions, and other Ethereum-specific things like logs. Um, let me clarify why do we need logs actually. This is because they represent tokens transfers. So this is actually the most significant data for our balances calculation. The raw data is stored to S3 and then queried using Athena, which is a very convenient tool providing an SQL interface uh, to the data stored in S3. As an output, uh, we should provide an access to the data via a low latency customer facing API. And uh, let's now discuss all these steps in detail. We start from the data ingestion step. We now ingest data directly from an Ethereum node using JSON RPC API. Uh, here is an example request to get a block info. Ethereum API accepts post requests with uh, details included into its body. The API method used is get block by number, which is highlighted in blue. And the first parameter, which is in red, is the block number as a hex value. And the second parameter, which is in yellow, is a boolean, which is when false makes the block response from Ethereum API to contain only transactions hashes. When true, transactions are embedded as full pledged objects with all the attributes. So here is an example block response from Ethereum API. It includes the block details like number, hash, and many others, and all the transactions details like sender address, guess, value, and also many others. This allows us to export all the transactions of a single block in a single request instead of iterating and fetching them individually. Moreover, the Ethereum API supports batch mode, so you may export multiple blocks in a single call and reduce the HTTP overhead. Once blocks and transactions are fetched, we run another API method to export transaction receipts and uh, include logs. And this actually finished the data ingestion stage, pretty simple. So what about an Ethereum node? Where are we actually fetching the data from? 
You may have noticed that in the example request, I have used s.publicrpc.com as a URL. This is one of many publicly available Ethereum API endpoints. Ethereumnodes.com contains a list of such services. Some of them are available free of charge, some others provide a trial period or limited free access. So for a basic use case, you don't even have to run your own node to export the data. However, let's do a brief comparison and see if you have to run a node yourself. When running a public node, you don't have to maintain the node software or pay for any resources. Whereas when you own a node, it requires you to run a virtual machine and configure the Ethereum node software package. Uh, a fully sync node also requires a huge disk to store several terabytes of Ethereum data. However, when using a public node, you're limited by a service provider. A provider may limit the number of requests you send to a node and even support some Ethereum methods partially. For example, traces. It's a very heavy thing to export, so this is often limited by the uh, providers. The last but not least is API performance. When requesting a public node, you're affected by HTTP overhead. With your own node, you may access its data directly via a local IPC connection at a lightning fast speed, limited only by your node resources bandwidth. Anyway, for our use case, a number of free public node providers with a fallback strategy was enough to export the full history in a couple of weeks. So running a public node is definitely the best option for a quick prototyping, while owning a node provides you with limitless optimizations on the resources level. So now, once we have all the raw data stored in our S3, how should we query it? I'm a huge fan of AWS Athena, which is a query engine based on Facebook's open source Presto. It is not a database since it doesn't have its own storage. Instead, it reads directly from S3 and thus provides an SQL interface to the data in S3. Athena is capable of parsing JSON. So once the data lands to S3, we may run Athena's queries right away. For example, let's take the minimum blocks timestamp from blocks with flattened loads and filter by an event signature. As a result, we get the first ERC20 transfer date, which is the 27th of October 2015. Frankly speaking, this is not a completely valid Athena SQL, but it gives a basic sense of how working with arrays and nested structures work in Athena for JSON, for example. Uh, however, using Athena requires some skill. It is built by an amount of scanned data, so running a native select would cost us more than $20 for a single query. To reduce the costs, I have reformatted the data into a compressed parquet, and this gave us a 97% volume reduction and thus the same cost savings. The only limitation of Athena for us is that Ethereum operates 256 bits numbers. And Athena's limit is 40, excuse me, is 64 bits for integers. Uh, what I did is implemented long arithmetics in Athena using SQL. I will skip the details now due to time limit of the conference talk. You may ask me in face-to-face -face session or like reach out to me through Discord, but also you may find the details in my original article on Medium. I really suggest you getting familiar with my approach since it was a, an amazing challenge for me. Um, so what's next? Uh, yeah, given the huge numbers support in Athena, we may now calculate the balances for all the tokens by simply summing up all the transfers values. So this pipeline stage is also completed. Uh, and here is the final step of the pipeline, providing access to our data consumers. As you may remember from the first slides, we want to have an API which returns tokens balances for every wallet. So for an Ethereum address, we get a list of tokens it contains and their IDs and balances, and that's enough actually for us. And the transfers history API is very similar here. Uh, so for this, I have decided to simply use in AWS Lambda function, but watch to use as a database for this API. We may read balances directly from Athena where they are actually calculated. But Athena's purpose is analytics, which means it is designed to operate huge amounts of data at once. While a customer facing API, like the one we are building, needs to read just an individual record or several ones at a time. 
You may Google for OLTP versus OLAP databases for more details on this topic if you are not familiar with differences. And I'm showing the abbreviations on this slide for your convenience. In simple words, using an appropriate database allows you to significantly reduce the latency and costs. So uh, our balances and transfers API requires another database, a quicker and more cost efficient for individual records retrieval, not for a batch processing. So DynamoDB is a good choice here. So what we do now is calculate balances and transfers for each wallet using Athena, and then import this minified purpose specific data set into DynamoDB, which means that in S3, we still have a full data set of raw data, while DynamoDB contains only tokens, balances, and transfers. So how do we import the data into DynamoDB? I was lucky enough to start this work after a new function in AWS has appeared for this. It's called import from S3. It is so new that it still has a corresponding label on AWS Web Console, as you may see. This functionality amazingly suits the case of uploading huge data sets from S3 into DynamoDB. Uh, our data set size is close to one terabyte, so uploading it using a regular DynamoDB API calls like put item would take several days and cost a lot. But when using this awesome functionality, the time drops down to several hours. Um, however, we export new blocks in the S3 on a daily basis, and we want the DynamoDB tables to be updated in real time, which means that once a new block appears, we should immediately update the balances for all the affected wallets. For this, I have introduced a streaming part of the solution. Its logic is quite simple. The script continuously requests the latest block number from an Ethereum API. When a block number is incremented, the script fetches the latest block and its receipts and applies balances updates directly to DynamoDB. Polling interval is 10 seconds, so the streaming part is latency is less than 10 seconds from when a new block appears. But what if we want to reduce the latency? I see several ways to achieve this. One of them is using web sockets instead of polling approach. Currently, to fetch a new block, the streaming script polls Ethereum API for the latest block number. And when the number increases, the script fetches the new block. If there is no new block, the script sleeps for 10 seconds. This sleeping interval is configurable, so we may decrease it, but still the approach is based on polling. So instead of this, I suggest using the API's subscribe method. It is based on a WebSocket connection and notifies a client when a new block appears. So this allows to start processing a new block immediately, not waiting another several seconds till the next polling cycle. Also, running our own node will reduce the data extraction overhead and tuning the node hardware may achieve even better performance. So to recap, what we have now is a batch part run on a daily basis and the streaming part run continuously. Um, just to clarify, we don't rerun DynamoDB imports on a daily basis. Daily, we only collect new blocks and logs to S3. This allows us to rerun the balances calculation based on the full history up to the last day. In particular, we did a full rerun when ERC721 and the ERC1155 support was introduced, since this required to rescan all the logs and extract those tokens transfers from them. The data was then re-uploaded to DynamoDB and a streaming script was attached uh, to update to the table in real time. The streaming script listens for the new blocks continuously and keeps the data up to date. Um, so the solution I have presented to you is flexible, generic, and scalable enough to support other blockchains too, and specifically EVM-based like Solana, since they provide the same API for blockchain data extraction. However, the solution is not limited to EVM-based blockchains only, and we may support Bitcoin too, for example. The only challenge is to implement an adapter for data extraction and find a data node. So this is the end of my data platform presentation block, let me draw your attention to the key takeaways of my talk. If you are building a similar solution, use public Ethereum nodes for a quick prototyping. And remember that they may fail often. So implement a fallback strategy to switch between providers if some of them are unavailable. 
um, as best data engineering practice, store the data in the same format as the data source has. Uh, this allows you to rerun any data processing without relying on a faulty data source, because this way you actually own the full data set in a resilient big data infrastructure. In our use case, the rawest format was JSON, obviously. Uh, oh yeah, uh, actually there is another thing missing in the talk, uh, the public BigQuery data sets with Ethereum data. Uh, yes, Google hosts the public data sets accessible for everyone, and you may use them to get a basic sense of Ethereum data at scale. It contains separate tables for blocks, transactions, logs, and many others, including even traces, the ones that are heavily like exported from the data nodes. Uh, so, but remember, when you run any query against the public data set, you pay for it, not the owner of the data set. So if you run select all without any data filtration, you will pay several dollars for just a single query. I have originally started with BigQuery data, data sets myself, so this approach is well described in my article too, including its limitations and caveats. Anyway, I recommend you to first play around with them and get some sense of the data before implementing your own solution. And here is a golden rule of any architecture. Use the right tool for a right job. Remember the Athena example. It works with big data only and should not be used for individual records retrieval. Don't be afraid to introduce another component to your infra if it better suits a specific need, like I did with DynamoDB. Yeah, actually choosing the right tool for the right job is what solutions architects like me are paid for <laughs> and paid very well. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, thank you for your attention today. Uh, let me remind you that my talk is based on my Medium article. It covers the majority of aspects in detail and much more. In particular, public BigQuery datasets, how to use them, and even how to reuse the BigQuery data in S3 to repopulate your data lake. These data sets, are, uh, data sets are updated using an open source package called Ethereum ETL. And in my article, I describe its advantages and limitations and share my motivation towards implementing my own pipeline from scratch instead of using this existing tool. Also, the aforementioned 256 bit support in Athena, the article describes my pure SQL long arithmetic solution, and it was an amazing challenge, honestly. Uh, so I would be really happy to hear your thoughts. Um, also, in the article, I share all the estimations for exporting and hosting the data. And actually, in the very beginning of the article, I also explain why CoinStats was not satisfied with existing solutions and which exact set of requirements my architecture has met based on the product request. I wish you enjoy reading as well as you have enjoyed the talk. And here is the very final slide of my presentation. Uh, let me tell a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm an expert data engineer and cloud solutions architect. I help startups to launch their data platforms and work with a variety of domains from e-commerce to financials. Through the last year, I have advised more than 20 successful data startups and have been directly working on the implementation for six of them. Two of them were actually backed by Y Combinator in the year 2021. So feel free to connect with me via LinkedIn or Telegram using the links given on the slide and looking forward to helping you build another big thing in the data area. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer your questions now here and later on Discord and Telegram. And also in the face-to-face. -face. Thank you very much, Anton. Right. I think we will all definitely have to read that article and learn more about, yeah, how cool, you thanks. got to so build this at time. Many questions so far or should we switch to face to face right now i think um, we will be we switch to face -to -face. yeah uh, i'm gonna yeah. post the face to face link in the discord chat so you can take it from there okay then thank you very much everyone uh it was a big pleasure for me to uh, give this talk and yeah bye have a good attendance to the pie chain conference bye everyone <laughs>